people are burnt out on the story that all of our happiness should ultimately be permanent. The more we go into the love and the light, the more we must also be willing to venture into the opposite of those emotions, the depression, the anguish, the sorrow. The deepest grief, if you go all the way into it and you don't resist it, will crack you open into the most profound gratitude. This horrible feeling that I want to avoid and repress and get over and transcend is actually the gateway to my greatest liberation. Your pain often becomes your purpose. I hope it's not just feel good stuff for those who want more feel good stuff. In some ways it's the opposite of feel good because what we're actually talking about is letting yourself feel all the shitty parts of being human and finding the freedom in those feelings. You know, if we're betting on ourselves, if we're an entrepreneur, if we're a creative, if we're putting ourselves out in the world, we're always gonna feel this tension of like the things that we wanna do, but are we good enough? And I'm not quite sure. And people call it imposter syndrome and all this stuff. But when I heard you say, that you had to work to end the war with yourself. I was so curious what that meant to you. I mean, it's, I guess in order to unpack that, we'd have to talk about what we mean by the self. And the self is not one thing. So I think increasingly I'm learning and understanding that there are so many characters that live inside of us so many versions of ourselves, so many aspects of ourselves. And when they're in alignment and in harmony, it's super fun, right? It's that sort of like shapeshifter energy of, you know, in this moment, I'm the professional and I'm super focused in a meeting. And in this next moment, I'm, you know, surrendering with my lover. And this next moment, I'm having fun at a party with my friends and being silly. Like those are all the aspects of ourselves when, and they can coexist in harmony. I guess the war part comes when we have aspects of ourselves that feel equally important at, in terms of their voice at the table, yet they're in direct conflict with each other. Yes. yes. Uh, oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing that. You know, you just mentioned a whole bunch of different versions of us. I always tell people, you know, if you think about your friends getting married, right? We, we've, I've been with my wife for a very long time, but um, there was this one summer where we had to go to like five weddings in one year. And you know, you do the whole thing. You do the, the wedding parties and the bachelor parties and the bachelorette parties and the wedding and this. I always think, uh, you know, is the version of you with your friends hanging out at the bachelor or bachelorette party, is that the same version of you that's standing up there at the church in the tux or in the dress with, you know, the priest or the pastor and with grandma looking over your shoulder? Like they're both you, but they're not the same version of you. And I think in that context, it's like, cool, we can see that one is you having fun and one is you trying really hard not to offend anyone and clean up. But when you speak about, you know, our professional life or our personal life or who we choose to be married to or who we choose to have conversations with and how we show up in all these different spaces, the thing I struggle with, which I think most people do is like, I'm not quite sure which is the real version of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure whether the real version of me is something that anyone wants. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's the core human wound. <laughs> The question of worthiness, of innate worthiness, worthiness beyond achievement, beyond label, beyond status, beyond all the external things that we use to validate our existence. And that is at the core, I think, what this whole... That's why I do what I do, because I want to connect people to that version of themselves, the aspect of themselves that is dancing with all the other characters, letting them express, letting them be there, letting them have a voice in the conversation and a seat at the table, but also not being governed by them unconsciously to the point where it can feel a bit schizophrenic or it can feel unsafe to allow certain parts of ourselves to be seen in, you know, like, for example, I'll use my husband. He used to have his life in very neat boxes. Like there was compartments, you know, there was like his family life and who he was with his family. And then there was his work life. And then there was his go to Vegas and party like a rock star life. And none of these parts touched each other. They were very segmented and he was very comfortable with that because he didn't feel that the, the Vegas version of him would be, you know, loved and seen and respected in his business community and vice versa. Right. So, so it, it, in some ways we, we compartmentalize ourselves very unconsciously for approval and for validation. And as long as we need the validation to come from an external source, we are always going to feel at some core level disempowered. And so the game of personal transformation, of true transformation, and I'm not just talking about personal development because that's a different thing and I can share the difference if you'd like, but transformation, 
true transformation has to include the subconscious. It has to include the 85% of, of our operating system, of our way of being in the world that we can't see. And when we do that, and we shine the light of our awareness into those crevices, into those pockets, into those uncomfortable places, into the parts of us that don't feel worthy or safe or accepted by life, first and foremost. And we start to understand why, and we start to bring compassion and tools to those parts. We start integrating all of these fractured, separate parts of ourselves back into a more cohesive whole. And we have to really make contact with the part of us that unifies all of those seemingly separate aspects. And you might say that is, you know, connecting to your higher self, or this is where it starts to get a little spiritual. And so, you know, a lot of times when people go on this path, they end up in a spiritual place because it's difficult not to. But even if you just look at it through the lens of awareness, pure awareness uh, of consciousness itself, like what is that, which is what, which doesn't change and which never questions its own worth. And it's actually awareness itself. And there, there's a way to practice coming being a human from that place. So witnessing and watching what's happening, allowing yourself to feel the richness of what's happening, right? We're not talking about transcending your emotions entirely. There's a time and a place to transcend, but there's, I would say really the bigger point is to actually allow ourselves to immerse in the human experience. That's where the juice is. But can we immerse without getting identified to the point where we lose ourselves in it and we are no longer... We no longer have the steering wheel of our experience in the seat of our awareness. Does that make sense? The way I describe it? It does. It, oh, for sure. It's funny. Uh, a few months ago, I had Scott Barry Kaufman uh, on the podcast. He's the author. Uh, he's a cognitive scientist and he's a professor and he wrote this book, uh, Transcend. When I had him on, I said, um, your book is about transcending and you help people transcend. What does that mean? Like, just help me understand what does that mean? He was like, well, and, and it, we, I don't want to put him, <laughs> I don't want to call him out here, but, uh, but he struggled to explain to someone who isn't in the spiritual world even or in that world, like, what the heck does that mean? And so when you say, you know, your husband is in, is in Vegas mode, one, you know, family mode, the other, the first thing I think is like, oh man, I set up those walls in my own life because I don't know if, um, you know, I don't know if I want to share me being a dad with the world. And I don't know if I want to share with my kids the conversations I have on this podcast. And honestly, I'm not sure if I want my family to see most of what I'm doing. And then I go to post something on LinkedIn and I'm like, oh, what about all those people I used to work with eight or 10 years ago? What if they think I'm... If I'm saying like all that stuff we used to do together was terrible somehow because I'm... You know I mean? Like I just... I, I don't want anyone to know anything about any of it because I don't feel like they, anyone will really accept these other versions of me that they may not see or be aware of. And so we can go down that path. We can talk about transcending and maybe you can help me understand more what you mean by that. Um, but I love this conversation and we're going to get spiritual and that's okay. So we don't have to apologize for that by any means. So if you're listening or if you're watching and you're not quite comfortable with it, then that's cool. You can go watch something else, but we're going to have a real conversation here today. So, um, what do you think of transcending or do we want to go down the path of like, how the heck do we show up and take down these walls and just show up as the same version of us in all areas and have the courage to do that? Well, I guess I would ask you a question. What you just described of feeling like there's all these different parts and you don't feel safe to share them in, 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 the, in their full uncensored expression. How does that feel? Like what is the predominant feeling that you receive from that being your experience? Um, uh, Embarrassment, uncomfortableness, uh, uh, anxiety. Um, I stay up at I, like this is one of the things that keeps me up at night. Yeah. Um, even right now, you shifting to talk about me, I am totally cool with. Uh, I love like I I love talking about myself. I'm my I'm my favorite topic. <laughs> but um, I go well. I don't know if my audience wants to listen to this, and I don't know if anyone will want this. And what if? And like, should I be more strategic? And yeah. should the con like no one came here to listen to Mark and. So but everyone there's always can, that chatter. Everyone can relate to what you're sharing. So by you being willing to let us into your internal dialogue and verbalizing it, 
a couple of things are happening. One is you're actually creating a deeper level of resonance and connection and intimacy with the people who are listening because everyone has that voice and everyone has that same conversation of what if people don't like this or what if I'm being stupid or what if I'm taking this podcast in the wrong direction or right? whatever the thing is, insert your particular pain point. We all have that. That's what it means to be at war with yourself in a way we're coming full circle to that first you know opening question and the beauty of having these conversations is first of all we need to normalize that this is actually true for all of us on this planet i don't care how many millions or billions of dollars you have in your bank account i don't know how i don't care how gorgeous or perfect your spouse is i don't care you know what you've accomplished in the material world we all have this conversation with ourselves and there's this fracture this rift ultimately that i believe we have the opportunity to spend our life integrating all of these again separate aspects of ourselves so what you described you said that there's the part of me that feels anxious and embarrassed and at the core of all of those things again we're going to find this question around worthiness which is a whole conversation that we could have like not trusting at the core, your innate self-worth um, because you haven't actually built a reservoir of trust with yourself yet that would allow you to tap into that well when there is no external validation that is telling you, no, you're doing a great job. You're actually doing well, right? When there's nothing external reflecting that back to you, what do you fall back on, right? So that I would say is really a big part of the journey of becoming. And then to kind of weave your other question of transcending into that, in more traditional Eastern philosophy and spirituality, like Buddhist traditions and stuff, which are very actually quite Westernized at this point. And so we're, when we think of spirituality, we often think of those methods, um, meditation, you know, all of these things often come from those lineages. It is a model of transcendence, meaning we sit quietly, we close our eyes and we find our breath and we watch, we, we practice being the observer of our experience and we watch the embarrassment. We watch the shame. We watch even your ability to speak it already shows me that you have the awareness of it, right? Most people aren't even there yet. That's That dialogue is happening without them having any real true awareness that those are conversations that are happening in their head. They're so identified with the conversation that it just feels like it's true. It's just is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the fact that you can actually already s sit here across from me and say, I can observe this part of me that's saying this about myself shows me that you're already actually quite self-aware. But then the next question is, so what do you do with that? So again, in the transcendent model, you would essentially witness it and not identify with it. And by doing so, you would identify more with the aspect of yourself that is beyond human, that is the pure awareness, that is consciousness itself, just watching and witnessing and observing these stories, these narratives, these feelings and letting them kind of happen, but also not getting entangled in them. And that's one way to do it. And that's powerful. And I've done a lot of that. And I would say in some ways, that's a little bit more of a masculine way of operating. Like the masculine is more of the transcendent model. And that's why I think that resonates deeply with our culture and why you see that because we live in a you know predominantly masculine driven culture at this time. And so it makes sense that those practices would be what work for people and what resonate because it's kind of, it speaks to our core operating system. Now, what I'm interested in is kind of the polarity to that, the opposite of that, which is more of a feminine model, which is actually the, instead of transcending, we descend into the material of the emotional uh, trigger itself. So instead of disassociating from it and just kind of observing it, we go down and into it, meaning we allow the emotion to overtake us. We become one with it. <laughs> And the shame, the self-loathing, the judgment, the fear, the anxiety, whatever the thing is. And by not resisting it at all, by allowing ourselves to completely immerse into it, we transform it, we alchemize it into a new experience. And that to me is what's actually like really exciting about this path because I believe we we came here into this life to be humans for a reason. And I don't think we're here to just watch our emotions. I think we're here to learn from our emotions and to use them as access points into a deeper state of understanding of what it means to be alive. I'm smiling. I, I saw you react to me smiling only because it's striking so true to me. You know, my wife and I 
uh, we go for a walk, you know, since the pandemic happened, we go for a walk every day for about an hour with our dog and it's our time to connect and debrief. And it helps take me from work mode to like family mode, four o'clock every day we do that. And my wife is like the biggest, uh, she's a performer, she's an actress, she's a singer, she's, um, she's the biggest feeler. Mm. And I am, I am becoming like, I think we're all feelers and we're all thinkers, but it's just depending on how we filter. And I am so good at compartmentalizing. I am so good at like thinking my way through everything and being an analyst. And, and my wife will have this like emotional high and then this low. And she used to fight it. She used to spend like a, she used to waste a lot of time trying to fight the feeling. And finally, I was like, I was like, you just need to like, like you're going to feel terrible for the next two days. Enjoy it. Like, like enjoy how delicious the sadness is. Yeah. That's what enjoy I'm how about. amazing, like just cry and just do all this stuff. And then on the other side, you're going to be like, Ah, I feel better. Like, <laughs> yeah. so, but I'm wondering if this is like, because I always thought as like a Mark and a Jack energy. I didn't see this as a masculine or feminine energy or a thinker and a feeler energy or whatever you want to call it. And so, uh, I like the thought of like feeling my way through things makes me so uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't want the feelings. I want fewer feelings. Yeah. They get in my way, don't they? Yeah. Well, you've been conditioned to believe that. And I think that's a big wound for the masculine in general is if you think about it from a, like a, from a more sort of purely survival standpoint, compartmentalization is a very important skill set, right? If I'm, if I'm living out in the wilderness with my family and, you know, hunter gatherer era, and there's a true threat to our survival, if I go into an emotional breakdown, I'm not going to be very useful to my family, right? So as the protector, as the masculine role in that paradigm, I need to be able to compartmentalize my human emotional experience entirely so that I can focus on the task at hand, so that I can fight, so that I can protect, so that I can run, whatever the thing is, right? And so I need to override my emotions entirely, transcend them entirely in order to be able to be of service to the moment. And everyone, you know, knows that scene in that in the action movie that is so annoying where the girl just won't stop crying and she's just freaking out. And you're like, just shut up. You're being chased by the zombie. Just shut up and run, you know, God damn it. Um, and so it but it is what you're experiencing in your marriage is a microcosm of a collective phenomenon that's always happening. So there's always this dynamic between these poles, between masculine and feminine, which we call alpha and omega because we're we're trying to remove the gender stereotypes that come with the words masculine, feminine, alpha being masculine, omega being, being feminine historically, um, because the truth is we all have both. And you also have omega. You have feminine energy inside of you. I can feel you. I can feel your heart. I can feel your spirit. You know, like it's I very cry. present. I, I cry all the time. <laughs> I know. I can see that. So that's in you. Hold on. And you can see that? You can see that? How do you see that? I don't know. It's a sensing maybe more than a seeing. Okay. But it's through your eyes. How did you come across this? How did you find this? Because if we go back, you haven't always lived this way. Um, if we go back through your career in terms of you being an actress and a performer and moving from you know New York uh, to LA with with like only two thousand dollars in the in the bank and you know four weeks later <laughs> basically having nothing and um, you weren't always uh, as far along this path or even as um, as I guess mature I might say uh, as you are today and so what I get to meet and what we get to meet is like a work in progress but certainly someone who spent a lot of time on this how did you learn these lessons? Well, I mean, in some ways, I was a very, as a lot of children, I think are naturally, I was a very sensitive child, like highly empathetic. And it was a bit crippling because I felt things so deeply and uh, the world is kind of an intense place to feel things so deeply. Um, and I didn't know that I was feeling things deeply because that was just my experience. But, you know, watching the lawnmower come and kill all my friends that were growing the grasses and the weeds and the flowers was like a traumatic experience for my nervous system. So like, that's the level of sensitivity that I had. Uh, and I think because of that, and because I didn't have tools for how to navigate that, and I didn't see it as a superpower, ultimately, I found there was kind of two things I was always trying to do, which were actually, again, coming back to war with yourself in conflict with each other. One was I turned to performance art 
to help me find a safe outlet for my emotions. So acting became my thing. And it was my thing from when I was a kid all the way through my 20s. Um, Because that gave me a societally approved safe place to let myself feel things that I wouldn't feel in my normal life, specifically challenging feelings, traumatic feelings, difficult human experience feelings. And so that was a really healthy outlet for me. And then the thing that was in conflict with that was I was also in my regular life, I was trying to be cool. And the very definition of the word cool is kind of the opposite of like deeply sensitive and feeling and, you know, passionate and empathic um, because people who are cool generally don't give a fuck, right? They're like, whatever, I don't, you can't, whatever, you know, whatever you think about me doesn't matter to me. At least that's the sort of superficial version of cool that we have in our culture or that was, that's modeled to us that should be aspirational. So that was what I wanted to be because I didn't want to be the hypersensitive one that, you know, was always a little bit odd and, and out there. And you, you grew up in Germany? I did. I grew up in... Well, I, it was a lot of back and forth. I was born in New York. I moved to Germany when I was five. Then I moved back to New York when I was 10. Then I was in Boston for a few years, then back to Germany when I was 15. And then I studied acting in Germany and then came to LA when I was 21. Do you think anything uh, about the German culture? Because I have I come from a, a German family. When I say German family, like my dad was born in Berlin. My mom is first generation Canadian. Mm-hmm. Um, and I only noticed over the last year that a lot of the things that I struggle with, which is like, you have to achieve, but you can't be seen trying to achieve. Like you can't be seen trying too hard. It has to just come natural to you. It has to come effortlessly. Um, And like a few of these things that are kind of like part of my family, um, I realize I think are actually just like part of German culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm curious, uh, having seen both sides of the American versus German culture and being part of the entertainment industry and all of this stuff, do you think the German influences has kind of shaped you in a certain way? I do. I do. And I think with German culture is, you know, kind of stereotypically a bit, you know, reserved and very pragmatic and like they're always on time and efficient and all the things, which is, of course, not true. It's a it's not entirely true, at least. But it is true that from a societal perspective, um, Germans like rules and they like to stick to rules. And I think Personally, that's also a trauma response to what happened in the Second World War because shit got really out of hand. And the reason it did is because there was a lot of emotional energy that was, you know, manipulated ultimately and used in service to something quite horrific. And so I think the pendulum is swinging really far the other direction into more of a rational, pragmatic and less emotional kind of way of being also as a way to, you know, again, trauma response like that didn't work out. Let's try something different, you know, because that's how we work. We work within a spectrum of polarity. So we often will have pendulum swing within our own emotional experience. And that can happen on the microcosm of a personal life, as well as a whole culture, a whole, you know, country, um, a whole kind of collective experience. So I would say that is true. And so, you know, being proper and appropriate and sort of conforming is something that's from a values perspective is more celebrated in Germany than in the U S there's always been this. And that's what drew me back to the U S ultimately this like rags to riches, you know, anyone can do it. And the messier it is in some ways, the better the story, you know, and there's this really exciting and raw and kind of um, powerful cultural narrative that we have in the U S that is very appealing to people who are entrepreneurial or, you know, big dreamers. Um, and so I've always had both, I would say. Yeah. Do you think that the American vision, uh, the rags to riches, the, anyone can do it. I know it's true for some people. Um, but in your experience, is it true or is it, um, a collective story that we're being sold? Mm, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think I do believe that everyone has the capacity, but I, I also believe that we're not all designed to do the same thing. So we at Becoming, we talk a lot about who are you designed to be? And that implies that there's a uniqueness to your design. There's a particular way in which you, like you came into this life designed to do something. And that might not be to, you know, be the founder of a startup of a unicorn startup. Like that might not be your design. In fact, the reason it's called a unicorn is because it's probably very few people. It's probably a very small percentage of the population that is meant to have that. So I think all of us have incredible potential that, you know, very few ever fully tap into. 
And I think, so I do believe that's true. I do believe we all have capacity to realize our potential. But I think a lot of us are trying to realize our potential outside of our design because of a story or an, or a really a, a, some pro, cultural programming that has made us believe that we should want the thing that the other person got. And so we aspire to do things that might not actually be in alignment with what is our best way of sharing our gifts with the world. And we have a very strong narrative in our American culture around bigger equals better. And that one is really, it's systemic and it's deeply embedded in our unconscious ways of operating. And I notice it within myself. I can see how, you know, when I, when I am asked to be on someone's podcast, the first thing I do is go look at how many followers does this person have and how many, how many views, (laughs) how many downloads, you know, like, because if it's under a certain number, I'm probably not going to do the podcast. And that is also in truth, a manifestation of this more equals better sort of syndrome. Um, and so it's very deep and I'm constantly b- battling it as well because I have a deep desire to scale my message and a deep desire to scale my impact. And I also know the deeper part of me knows that it's not necessarily about going wide. It's about going deep. Um, to go deep with with few can be just as powerful as to go wide with millions, right? Um, but it, But even though I know that, I still observe my behavior adhering to this more equals better paradigm. Okay. So can I, can we use this as a, a quick metaphor or lesson for me to understand the difference between masculine transcending and feminine descending? So you notice in yourself this feeling of like more is better. I want more. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have to believe that let me, my thought is that like, if we're going to be masculine and transcend, I'm going to step back. I'm going to make it objective. I'm going to go, okay, well, what am I feeling and why am I feeling it? And what am I touching upon? And oh, what's the root cause over there? And I wonder why that happened. And I wonder why I reacted that way. And you may be working through it. Um, what, what, I may have gotten that wrong even, <laughs> but what's the descending way to be able to look at this? Yeah. I mean, I think what you just described, the example you gave is an intellectual processing. And that's really what therapy and psychology does really well, right? It's like, let's look at the problem and let's talk about it. Not a bad thing. It's just, it doesn't often create the results that people are looking for. At least it takes a long time. Because if you think of a human being as having many different layers, so we're not just our rational thinking mind. In fact, that's a much smaller percentage of us than the rest of it. So we have our physical, we have our mental, we have our emotional, we have our spiritual bodies. And so those are all a factor in how we perceive ourselves in reality. And so traditional talk therapy will literally only appeal really to the mental and maybe a little bit to the emotional, but only to the degree that you're actually talking about the emotions. You're not actually necessarily going into the emotions and feeling them. That would be more of a somatic approach. So obviously the emotion, the emotional body and the physical body intersect, right? Because you're feeling your emotions in a somatic way, meaning in a sensory way, um, through your nervous system, you're feeling your body, your emotional experience. And yet also emotion is energy. So the emotion also exists beyond what we perceive to be matter. Um, That's why when you watch a really deeply moving scene in a movie, that energy translates through the screen into your nervous system and evokes an emotional experience, right? So emotion can be transmitted just in the same way sound can be transmitted through frequency. The way that you are perceiving the words I'm speaking right now is through waves of energy that, that are moving, right? into your the technology that is your ear that is then translating those sounds into meaning. So um, the more feminine approach of descending would basically be to get out of your head entirely and let your physical body and your emotional experience become the prominent ex- the prominent forefront of your experience. And that is something that most of us struggle to do. Because we've never been given permission to do it and we've never been trained how to do it. We've been actually conditioned to forget how to do it. Because if you look at a kid, like a toddler, 
<laughs> they're doing that they are, all the time. They are emotional train wrecks. It's yeah, like exactly. it's like this popsicle <laughs> is the greatest thing in the world, and then the next second, it's like this is the worst thing ever. <laughs> Well, that's because their cognitive, their mental, rational mind hasn't developed yet fully. So they're just pure feeling. They're pure omega. They're pure omega energy. And so everything that's happening in any given moment, they're experiencing it without censoring it, without filtering it, without explaining it away. And they're experiencing it in real time. And what do we do when our kids have strong emotional reactions? A lot of times we're like, shh. Please be quiet. Please don't do that. That's inappropriate. Go sit over there by yourself. Go in your room, right? That for years and years eventually creates, wow, I must not be able to trust what's happening to me emotionally, even if it feels very true. And then simultaneously, we're going through a school system that is hyper-focused on the cognitive development and the intellectual, rational part of our operating system. Again, we need to be rational. We need to be logical. We need to be able to step back and look and observe our experience. These are super important things. Critical thinking. Yes, I'm all about it. But when it becomes so chronic and it's the only thing that we identify with as being the way in which we operate, then we lose access to one of our greatest superpowers, which is actually our emotional body and our physical body. And I think that's why so many people are so miserable is because they've lost that connection. And so how can you learn? Um, I find this fascinating. And this is, I, I didn't think we were going to talk about any of this stuff. <laughs> you haven't challenged um, me yet. You, were, you got me all excited. You're like, I'm going to push back. I'm going to challenge you. I'm gonna but it's mostly explain. because I'm just like, wow, this is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, listeners, before you hit record, I was like, I think we're, I think I'm going to challenge you a lot and play devil's advocate. And instead now I'm just like, tell me more about how this works. Um, <laughs> I mean, what do I know? I'm just, you know, one perspective. There's a lot of different perspectives. This, this is just where I've arrived in my journey. I, okay. So okay. I love it. Now, so yeah. you were, let's get back to your story real quick. So you were an actress. Yeah. And, um, and one of the stories that I've heard you talk about, like like cutting your hair, for example, um, my wife, when I met my wife, she was 16. I was 17. We're high school sweethearts. We've wow. been together for 23 years now, married for 18. That's beautiful. Congratulations. I, I used to be embarrassed by it because people would be like, oh, and now no. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty proud. I'm pretty proud of this. That's but, epic. Um, but when we met, uh, she had blonde hair because it was uh, 2000. It was, uh, you know, very Gwen Stefani, no doubt, like blonde hair. And I like blondes. And so for years and years and years and years and years and years, she would always dye her hair. And she never just told me that she didn't want to keep dyeing her hair. Like she wanted to do something different. She wanted to have darker hair or, or change things up or purple hair or whatever. But she knew that I really like blondes. And so finally, after like, I don't know, like 15 years... She's like, I'm going to do this because she hit the point where she's like, screw it. I'm going to do it for myself as opposed to always keeping my hair a certain way for Mark or for other people. And then she noticed that like one, I got used to it and it didn't really care. I was more attracted to her being ha uh, happy and confident than blonde. And she then a few years later finally admitted to me that she only did it for 15 years because of me. And I was like, what? Like, that makes me feel terrible. Like, I don't want you to do this thing that you don't like doing and don't have to do because you think that it's important to me when it's not important to me and your happiness is more important to me. And so it's like such a small example. And yet, like, your hair is pretty badass. It's pretty cool. And I know from your past, um, this was kind of like a big thing for you, like a big moment. And I don't understand why we allow ourselves to stay stuck in these ways when there's such small things that can make us so happy. Yeah. Well, again, it comes back to contorting ourselves to be who we think we should be in order to receive love or in order to receive validation or in order to receive XYZ, whatever the thing is that we're looking for. Can, can you share the story though as to yeah. why this was such a big big, big deal? For sure. And it, for me, it was exactly that. I, I deeply wanted to succeed as an actress in Hollywood. And that was my mission at the time. And I dedicated a decade of my life to that profession, um, both in the study of it, in the, in the study of the craft, as well as then the pursuit of it professionally. And um, every single agent and manager that I had that represented me, that was the gatekeeper, ultimately, to what I really wanted, which was the gig, right? The job. 
uh, highly discouraged me from changing my look because the long haired brunette kind of girl next door version of Azria was in some ways the most broad and therefore had the most chance to get in the room for auditions. And the more unique and edgy and different you are, unless you already have, you know, fame and a following, then it doesn't matter. But if you're someone who's trying to break into the industry, they're just throwing, you know, throwing everything at the wall and trying to see what sticks because it's very difficult to even just get an audition. Um, and so they were encouraging me to not make myself unique and specific because they wanted me to ultimately to succeed. And so it was it, the contortion came from a place of this is a sacrifice that I have to make in order to have the thing that I want. But what I didn't know at the time was that what the thing that I wanted was I wanted to feel seen and whole and worthy. And I wanted to feel like I could share my message in a way that would resonate and land. And I thought that I needed permission to do that. I believed firmly that in order for me to feel those things, I needed to check certain boxes and, and show up a certain way and play the game. And then I would get the thing. And what this path of transformation has unlocked for me is the recognition that I don't need permission from anyone or anything outside of myself when I am in communication and direct contact with the part of me that already knows that I am all of it already right here, right now. I don't need anything to change. I can already tap into every emotion that I want to feel in an instant if I train myself to know how to become quiet enough in my head so that I can access that within myself. And if you think about it, that's actually all acting is. Because to be a good actor is not to play pretend and pretend to be the character, but to be a really good actor is to become the character, to become one with the character where there's no more, there's no difference. It's seamless. And so what that means is I need to, as an actor, be able to choose an emotion like going to a buffet and saying, I'm going to double click on sorrow, grief. I just lost my child. And I need to be able to feel that authentically in the moment. That's a skill that you have to develop in that particular profession. And what that skill taught me was that forget acting. I can do that in every single moment of my day. I can choose in every moment how I want to respond to any given circumstance. Even if I'm facing a phenomenal failure in my life, I can choose how I want to respond to that. Now, does that mean that I'm the ultimate control freak and I can always choose the perfect experience in every moment? No, because that would be boring. But what it does mean is that when I am faced with something that is triggered by an external event, something devastating happens externally in my reality, and that has an emotional impact on me. Because I'm so aware of the emotional terrain of my internal world, because I'm so present to it, I know that feeling, yes, it's there and it's valid. And right now it feels all encompassing. But I also know that once I let myself feel it fully and I descend into it and I immerse myself into it and I alchemize it from the inside out. And you even used some language that I thought was interesting, which was, you know, like relish in it or savor it, which is actually a method that I use, um, which is like, that's literally a tool, which is to make love to the thing, whatever the thing is, especially the worst thing. Like, can you make love to that? And there's an alchemy that happens. And then what you find, and this is the coolest part, you find that because we live in a world of opposites and a world of polarity, every single quote unquote negative emotion is actually an entrance or a portal into its polar opposite. So the deepest grief, if you go all the way into it and you don't resist it, will crack you open into the most profound gratitude. Fear, if you go all the way in and you let it completely take you over and you emerge on the other side, opens you to complete freedom. Your pain and often becomes your purpose. Like everything is connected. And so we think of things in such linear ways and such segmented ways, but everything is cyclical. If you look at the way nature operates, everything is cyclical. Everything, nothing is straight. Everything, every tree branch, everything grows in curves and cycles. And the same is true with the emotional spectrum. So we're, we have to think of it as more of a sphere and not as just this linear experience. So that's the cool part about this work is you realize that, holy shit, it's all connected. And this, this terrible thing that's happening to me, this horrible feeling that I want to avoid and repress and judge and get over and transcend, is actually the gateway to my greatest liberation.
And how do you know that to be true? Because I've lived it so many times. And I You just might be crazy. No, but I teach it to others and they have the same experience. So I have and They might be crazy. <laughs> Aren't we all? We might like so so as you're saying this, I have gone through a pretty big journey over the last 5 years. I believe we're all going somewhere. I feel I I can feel what you're saying. Yes, when things are really scary, if I have the courage to push through, which I often don't. I often, I've realized, would actually rather self-sabotage and play the victim uh, because it's so much more satisfying to like stay stuck than it is to do the really, really hard stuff to push all the way through all this, all these uncomfortable, terrible things. But then on the other side, it's like, um, you know, less anxiety, less depression, uh, more confidence, uh, uh, more uh, self-esteem. Um, being able to make decisions clear, being able to show up for other people in my life better, uh, being able to have more fun at work, being able to have the freedom of my calendar and my schedule. And like all these things that I've been able to learn over the last few years are coming from the very things you're talking about, which is the path is always through. Um, And if you can go deep enough and through. um, But I have these little moments where I go, I think I just drank the Kool-Aid. You know, I'm listening to these people and I want it to be true and I love it. And when I do it, it works. But, you know, maybe they're not very, maybe they think it's true, but they're not living the type of life I want to live. They don't have the type of relationships I want to have. They don't have the type of business. They don't have the wealth I want. Like, I want all of it. Mm -hmm. I want all areas of my life and the freedom in my mind and all of those things you're talking about. But it seems to me that most people who teach this stuff, go all in on it. And yet they don't have the business or they don't have the team or they don't have the income or they don't have the wealth or they don't have the material things. And I want those things too. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I'm always challenging to figure out like, do I just think this is true because I want it to be true? And does it even matter if it's true or not, if it works? I'm always asking myself that question. Yeah, it's an important question to ask because discernment is important, right? It's, it is. And I think... I ask myself that question too. And do you? Because you seem really confident in a lot of the stuff. Not, I'm, I mean, not on this call, like all of your teaching and, and everything that you're doing with Becoming. And I'd love to talk about that in book and everything. It's like, you know your shit. Uh, but I hope it's not just um, feel good stuff for those who want more feel good stuff. But I would say in some ways it's the opposite of feel good because what we're actually talking about is letting yourself feel all the shitty parts of being human and finding the freedom in those feelings. It's actually the opposite of the love and light, you know, everything is beautiful and I mean well everything is beautiful but the what I mean is there's a spiritual bypass that I think your discernment is saying, wait, hold on. I don't know if I want to blindly believe, you know, in in something that maybe isn't anchored in a deeper truth, which is that we live in a world of contrast and opposites. And so the more we go into the love and the light, the more we must also be willing to venture into the opposite of those emotions, the depression, the anguish, the sorrow. And so to me, when I talk about an growth or expansion of consciousness, it's spherical. It's not linear, meaning it happens in all directions simultaneously. So the more that I want to feel empowered and certain, the more I must look at where do I deeply doubt and feel like a victim. And how can I then intelligently work with the parts of me that feel those things to be true, not bypass them, not push them aside and just focus on my vision board and, you know, pray to the gods that I'll just always be happy and joyful because that's not the reality of what it means to be human, especially not right now on this planet. Um, Because the reality of what is actually quite alarming, we are actually in a pretty epic shit show on planet earth right now is my personal perspective. And in that, there's also a huge opportunity for systems change. And the first system that must be changed, I believe, is our internal system. It's the way in which we perceive reality. It's our lens on the world. It's our nervous system. That is the first place that systems change has to begin. And then it must ripple. And the reason that you might not resonate with people who are very evolved and developed in the spiritual personal development realms, but haven't been able to translate that into a professional or business context is because your discernment knows that we need both. We can't 
keep these things compartmentalized, right? This traditional model of like the guru or the monk on the mountaintop or whatever. Great. And there's a lot of things that need to be, there's a lot of problems to solve in our current society, (laughs) right? If we all sort of say, it, I'm moving to the Himalayas and I'm going to just meditate for the rest of my life. We're not actually engaging. And I think what is the true curriculum of the human experiences, which is to be with what is. And I like to use Nelson Mandela as an example sometimes, because I think, you know, he has sort of, I would say empirically, he has gained the respect of our cultural narrative. And the reason he gained that respect is because he went through a profound transformation of the self when every single freedom that you would think you need in order to be happy was taken away. When he spent 27 years of his prime, you know, his prime human experience locked up and emerged on the other side with an embodied knowing and a humble surrender to a deeper truth that ultimately led to him being able to lead his country to freedom after having spent decades of his life failing at that exact mission. So he's an example of what is possible when we focus on the inner system as the first step. And then what it looks like when that ripples out beyond ourselves into the people, the community, the organization, the company, the country, the world, right? Depending on what scale you want to play at, it is a crucial part of the blueprint of what we need in order to be able to make true change happen on this planet. And I think that's why you're also seeing a movement in business toward a greater uh, desire to understand the self. You know, my husband has been in in YPO, Young Presidents Organization, for 16 years. Um, And I've been speaking at conferences because he and I are, you know, we're doing our thing and we're going and sharing the good word and being like, hey guys, what do you think about maybe instead of focusing so much on your multi-million dollar company, like looking within and looking at where are things not aligned, where are you not actually happy? Where you are, where do you feel like you actually got all the things you thought you should have and you're still somehow feeling empty? Should we talk about that? And there is an awakening that is occurring in those communities that is really real because people are burnt out on the American dream and are burnt out on the story that all of our happiness should exist through external validation and should ultimately be permanent. That story is dying too. Happiness is not a permanent state. It cannot be. That is not the point. So there's a shift that I see happening in so many ways and industries and it's, and it is, it's slow, but it's in some ways it's picking up steam from my perspective. And I acknowledge that I live in a bubble. What you're looking for in terms of being able to truly lean all the way in and trust what you're hearing is you need embodied reference points of people who are able to stand in both worlds, who are able to stand in the world of emotional intelligence and spirituality and also business and finance and making shit happen on the planet. Yeah, that was my mission last year. So in January, what are we in? 23? 22. January 22. I had spent... um, I started my company when I was 23 in 2006. I spent 15 years working pretty hard and pretty focused on it. And I missed a lot of stuff with my four kids growing up. I remember one time, like maybe 2009, 2010, uh, my daughter came into the bedroom. She was like... She's now 16, but she was like 4 or 5. And I looked at her one morning because I had gotten home from work at like 4 in the morning. And it was like 8 a.m. or something. And I had to like get back to work again. And I was so exhausted and I was so tired. And the project really, frankly, didn't matter. And I looked at my little daughter and I went, I have to go. And I started crying. And she, I remember her saying like, why are you crying, daddy? And it was like, because... I have to go do this thing for a bank or something. <laughs> like, like it just it didn't even matter. Um, but I had worked so hard for all of those years. And so I know that hustle culture works. I know that you can be successful and you can achieve if you put all of you into it and work really hard and sacrifice everything else. It'll work. I don't know anyone who can do it without burning out though. And I don't know anyone who does it who at the end says it was worth it. But I know that it works. And so I want all of those things that I could get. Um, I don't need them as fast. But I want all of those things that I got without having to hustle. 
And so I don't know how to hold those two sides. You know, I don't know how to hold what I call of myself. This is my language for myself, what I call kind of the um, the more uh, spiritual, um, you know, totally opened, uh, like, like um, Zen version of Buddhism. So like Zen version of me where it's like, it's cool. Like these things take time. Why do we have to rush everything? Right? Like, like why not do great work you're proud of than always feel overwhelmed and always feel rushed. And so I want to approach life that way, but I want, I want to know that the outcome of hustling and business and everything else will also come along. Don't know that you can do both. I know that uh, Vishen um, Lakiani, who I had on the podcast from Mind Valley, wrote a book. You know, the I think it was called "The Buddhist and the Badass," which is this idea that maybe you can hold both. But in your experience with what you're doing at becoming, with what you're doing helping people figure out exactly who you are designed to be, you know, by radically embracing your greatest challenges, like is this possible in your opinion? I do believe it's possible. And I would say that I'm a student of how it's possible right now, an active student. So I haven't figured it out. I haven't cracked the code. I have a lot of ingredients and I've learned a lot of things. And I haven't been an entrepreneur and a founder for very long. Uh, so it's, I'm new to the game. And I feel like right now, my initiation is to try on... Well, I would say I'm actually coming out of that chapter now. But for the last six months, I was like, I'm going to try on hustle culture. I'm going to go into doing all the things, working 80 hour weeks, like being on Zoom calls for 10 hours a day, you know, project management tasks and like, like the gazillion things of what it takes to build a startup. I'm going to go all in and I'm going to see if it's for me. And I'm going to see what works about it and what doesn't. And I'm going to see if it's really, truly necessary because all did, the reference did, plays... Did you like it? The six well, months? Well, here's the thing. So there are parts of it that I did like. And... I like the intensity. I'm an intense person. I like the speed. I liked like there was a turn on for me in like, holy fuck, this is a lot. And I'm doing it and I'm showing up to it with excellence. And I'm like finding real satisfaction and reward in that. And so th th that was exciting to see that and feel that in me and be like, wow, I can actually really like, I'm much more capable than I thought I was. And there's also a big part of it that where I could see that I was disconnecting from the very thing that makes me truly powerful. I was not allowing myself the spaciousness that I need in order to recharge my batteries, in order to have the really good downloads and, and bring the really like the right puzzle piece to the right moment. Like I was losing the connection to the source of my wisdom because I was living in my head ultimately and glued to screens for six months. And so it was really important for me to feel that viscerally because that's what everyone else who's trying to build something significant is doing. And you know, when you have a burn rate of $250,000 a month, you're going to get up at the cra ass crack of dawn and you're going to do the thing, right? Because you need to get some revenue flowing. Like you need to do the, yeah. you need to do the thing. That's really real. So I was like, okay, I really want to understand. I really want to understand that from the inside out and I want to understand it. The way that I learn is by doing. So I immerse myself in things, right? Again, method acting style is kind of let me be the hustle grind entrepreneur and like really feel it. And it was cool to see that there was parts of it that I loved and I can see why it's so addictive. And I can see why people get trapped in it for a long time. And especially as the stakes get higher and you're deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, it gets harder and harder to do to say, no, hold on, time out. We need to take a break. It's not possible, actually. At least it doesn't feel possible. No, it's you have to keep the machine fed. Like exactly. you have to keep it fed. Or you have to burn the whole thing to the ground, but there doesn't tend to be a lot of like, hey, let's just slow down a little bit. Exactly. And so because I'm also someone who believes that we live in a paradigm of ultimately free will and choice, if when I was starting to tell myself that story of, no, you can't slow down, you, you can't stop, you have to keep going, I would also simultaneously push back and question that and be like, well, said who? <laughs> Right? What is this? What is this power that I'm giving to this thing that I'm building? Like, am I running the ship or is it running me? Really? If I'm like, let's get honest about it. And how much do I want to let it run me? Because sometimes it's kind of fun to like surrender to the thing. And sometimes it actually starts to really wear you down. Um, and so, yeah, what I would say is again, we get trapped in the construct of linear time. And one of the reasons that I think there's such a an interesting movement toward 
quantum physics and, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza has brought this forward in, a, I think, a, a, maybe the most credible way that we've had so far, because he is a legitimate doctor and a neuroscientist. And he's talking about things that are actually, you know, very seemingly metaphysical in nature. But I'll give you a simple example. If you have a string and you have an ant on one side of the string and the ant wants to make itself to the other side. So from point A to point B, then from a linear perspective, the ant needs to walk all the way across and then it'll get to point B. From a quantum physics perspective, if you just simply, if you're holding the string between your two hands, for those of you who are not watching this, but who are listening. So, you know, you're holding the string taut between two hands. If you just put your fingers together, now all the ant has to do is hop over and in an instant it has crossed the distance from A to B. So that would be an example of collapsing linear time. How do you do that? Well, you can do that through understanding that in the at the end of the day, we are operating in a reality that is not actually solid, but is entirely made of energy, right? It's 99.99999% wave and only 0.00001% particle. So it feels these things that we build, even our greatest dream startup or dream company starts to feel so solid and so heavy and so like, oh my God, it's so real. And I'm so stuck in this thing of like servicing this thing and showing up for this thing. And that's because we've lost touch with the deeper truth, which is no, everything is completely everything is malleable and there's so much more possibility available in any moment. I could spend 10 years building a brand trying to reach a million people, or I could drop into a super deep meditation, get into a state of consciousness where I receive access to a particular piece of instruction to reach out to a friend who then connects me to Joe Dispenza. Next thing you know, I'm on Joe Dispenza's podcast and in 10 days, I've reached a million people when it would have taken me 10 years. You know what I mean? But yes. it's, where do those moments of genius come from? They don't come from you being stressed out, sitting at your computer for 12 hours a day, locked in your mind of limitation. Because ultimately, linear time is a paradigm of limitation. It has to be. We have a limited amount of hours in the day. So if we're operating in limitation, we cannot tap into ideas that come from the unlimited infinite potential space. In the fall, I heard someone say in passing that uh, they go, money's energy, right? Like not, money's nothing more than energy, right? And, um, and if you hold it really loose and you realize that every time you hire you know, a staff person on your team, um, you're not hiring a staff person for efficiency. You are literally taking the energy that you would have to put into that role yourself and you are turning that energy into dollars and you're paying them those dollars and then they are bringing their full self their energy to the project or the problem and i was like wow this is so mind-blowing for me and so I, I went to youtube and i looked all around and um and like grant cardone has like one small clip and there there seems to be a little bit of stuff out there in terms of like how money currency is actually energy somehow in like the economic sense. But I haven't heard really many people talk about this. And so it's like more and more I've come to realize that that if we want to do really big things, like if we feel like we're called for more, and I think anyone listening to this is, we're all called for more. Like we have potential and we know that we're meant for more. But so much of these really hard things we have to do, the challenging things we have to do, uh, the decisions we have to make through uncertainty, um, the ego that we have to learn to kill and kind of put away. Uh, so much of this actually just comes to energy management. Um, and that's where I start to struggle too, because I like to think my way through everything. So I start to go like, I feel a certain way. But if, if I know that if I get up early, like, like if I don't overeat at night, I'm going to get a good night's sleep. And if I get a good night's sleep, I don't wake up, you know, tired. Uh, it's easier to wake up in the morning and I don't have indigestion in the morning. If I wake up that way, I feel super uh, lean and I feel strong, which means I'm more confident. And then I make my coffee and I go for my walk. I listen to uh, books on tape or I guess people don't say that anymore. What do they say? Audible. <laughs> I listen to books on tape. Uh, I listen to Audible and I get fired up and then I get about an hour of really deep thinking and then I get to wake my kids up every morning. I get to wake them up in bed and make them lunches and I get to take them to school and then I have a team meeting. 
So I'm just walking you through some stuff that I do because it's like each one of them I know contributes to like me feeling good. And that feels um, like it is the answer that mm-hmm. everyone should go into. And it feels incredibly indulgent and selfish. <laughs> and I'm going to keep giving you the same questions because, and you're going to keep saying, Mark, this is because we're conditioned to feel this way. It's because it's the Like, I already know, I think, where you're going to go with it. But um, when you talk about energy, uh, it reminds me just how important this is for our daily happiness and for the things we want to achieve and how overlooked it really is for most of us. Yeah. Yeah. And what I would say is, why don't you experiment? Because you already have the awareness that doing the things you just outlined for us puts you into a certain mindset, into a certain energetic state that ultimately serves you and optimizes your day, makes you feel more fulfilled, makes you feel more, really gives you more confidence in yourself, which is really valuable because you're making decisions that are in alignment with what you know is good for you. So that's the basic level, right? And then now if you added two weeks of breath work every single day, 15 minutes of breath work in the morning to measure, okay, how do I feel now? If I do that every single morning for two weeks, if I look at it from an energetic lens, how do I, how much more energy do I have in the day? How much more connected to myself do I feel? How much more confident ultimately do I feel? How much more power do I have? Really like true power, because that's what is, work is does. going for a really aggressive run breath work or, or no? Well, I mean, it could be whatever modality serves you, but I'm saying if you added a modality that is newer, that maybe you don't do so consistently that you know could unlock something, what you're doing is you're optimizing, you're exploring the realm of optimization. Then you might say, okay, now I'm going to add, you know, a cold plunge to that. Three times a week, I'm going to do a cold plunge. I'm giving you biohacking kind of examples because I feel like those are easier to identify with and a little bit more, you know, appropriate in our kind of like in this conversation. There's a lot of other modalities that would be, you know, much further out there, but but that's accessible, right? And so I would say become a scientist of your own experience and of your own energy. Because that's how if you are a person that needs data to to believe something or to trust something, then beautiful. What does it look like to get the data? What does it look like to run experiments and to then to see how you feel on the other side? Because your experience will be undeniable. And then if you can replicate it and other people can have a similar experience, now you know you're onto something. When you talk about modality, I have to imagine that maybe you're talking about psychedelics or other things people can be doing. I know that you've experienced some of this and had some real breakthroughs. Um, I find this really curious and interesting uh, that maybe 10, 20 years ago, it would have been something that was way out there. Uh, I have a friend who is um, who is a psychiatrist, psychologist. I feel like I should know the psychiatrist who specializes in PTSD and trauma, and um, and I know that it's been really helpful in clinical settings and what have you. But um, I often wonder if playing with uh, psychedelics or having these types of breakthroughs actually reveal truth, or if it's just a bunch of drugs just fucking us up, and we just like the way it feels, and we just run with it. <laughs> <laughs> have you done psychedelics i've been too afraid but i'm very primed for it <laughs> yeah i would say you can't answer that question from a theoretical place you have to have the ex- did, did i just answer it theoretically no, you, <laughs> or, you, or you mean you can't i'm saying you posed the question and i'm yeah. telling you the only way to get to the answer of am i, I making think- this all up am i just hallucinating and it's just a bunch of chemicals flooding my brain or i'm actually having like a truly spiritual experience you will not be able to ever answer that question as a bystander. Okay. Is it something to really carefully respect and be very cautious about um, and kind of fear a little bit? Or is that just, again, overblown drug culture, anti-drug culture, whatever? No, that's a great question. I do think you should have tremendous respect for it and understand that it needs the right container, meaning it needs the right set and setting, or it needs the right intention. It needs the right facilitation. Um, it needs to be the right moment. I don't believe everyone should do psychedelics and I don't believe that they should be treated lightly because what you're really doing is you're opening yourself up and putting a magnifying glass on all of the things that are inside of you. And some of those things might be very difficult. You know, sometimes we repress things maybe all the time we repress things, certainly traumatic things, because there's a part of us that doesn't feel safe to feel those things. So if we open those up and those become overwhelmingly real for us and we don't have the correct tools to actually process that experience, 
it can leave us worse than when we started. So it is incredibly important to respect it and to treat it with a lot of reverence. Um, I don't think you need to have fear. I think fear isn't necessary in, in that, but discernment is great. Um, and ultimately the question of, am I making it up is, you know, like, can there be distortion in a psychedelic journey? Yes. Have I seen people take psychedelics and think they're Jesus Christ? Yes. You know, and, <laughs> Hold on, and that's like, a real story or you're just making that up? No, that's real. That's real. Okay. Um, because it's giving you access to something that I believe is a connection to something that is true, but it still has all of your projections and all of your narratives and all of your internal world laid on top of it. And so it can get confusing to be able to look at, okay, what is actually in this experience really true? Like for example, with ayahuasca, which is a plant medicine that I've worked with a lot, it doesn't always give you direct access to the divine or to, you know, unconditional love or some of the things that a lot of people experience. There are people who have, who go into that work and only feel pain and come out more confused than they were before. And so the question would be, well, was that a mistake, right? Should they not have had that experience? And I would say that with the proper facilitation, the proper integration of that experience, you will ultimately always come out better on the other side even if it was painful, because what the medicine, in this case, ayahuasca was showing you or illuminating or bringing to the forefront of your awareness was something that was already inside of you that needed to be amplified and pronounced so that you could actually let yourself acknowledge A, that it's there and then start to deal with it. But the dealing with it doesn't always happen in the actual experience itself. It often happens in the work after. And that's a big part of what we do when we offer transformational work is we focus very much on the full spectrum of the journey, not just the experience itself. Um, but the preparation and the integration is its just crucial. Otherwise, it's just another peak experience or... Maybe it's not peak. Maybe it's, you know, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe the opposite. Maybe it's the opposite. But it's just another, it's just another experience that can create more confusion versus creating clarity. So tell me about becoming. Uh, you know, you've spoken about your husband uh a bit, you know, Benjamin, who uh I don't know if you guys are co-founders or what, but you guys got into this together. Um, you so you have the organization, uh, you have the book, uh, becoming everything you didn't know you wanted. Um, and so what are you guys doing with this? What is it? Um, how do you explain it? <laughs> how do you explain it? Well, I think we've been explaining it for the last hour and 15 minutes, you know? It, <laughs> <laughs> I meant more like the, the courses, the 30 acres that you guys uh, are building out, the book, the speaking. It's like, um, it feels to me more like a really cool experience where it's like, we have this mission and this purpose. And we're going to do a whole bunch of different things. So that way, whatever version of experience you need, we'll be able to give to you. I don't know if that's right or not, though. Yeah, for sure. So at the core, we're an organization that offers programs, transformational programs. And we offer them online and in person. And our programs are like any transformational, you know, personal development program. Uh, it, it's a series of tools and methods and methodology and, and modalities that help you go deeper into who you really are, who you are designed to be, uh, that question that we talked about earlier. So it helps you understand what are the ways in which you get in your own way, like what, where are your limitations, where are your fears, where's the parts of you that you're rejecting, you're resisting. How can you start to integrate those parts of you so that you're not trying to get rid of them, but you're actually including them in your experience. Um, and again, this is, less of a transcendent model and more of an integrative model in the sense that like, we believe you can't kill your ego. That's not the point. Your ego is the part of you that experiences itself as separate, which is a big part of what makes you an individual on the planet. Like, you know, we're not all meant to be homogenous and exactly the same, but we can recognize that we are all connected and that there's a unity there while also celebrating our individuality. And the big part of that is just self-awareness, really, right? Understanding why am I the way I am? What made me the way I am? We go deep into your backstory, understanding like your life circumstances. And then we take all of that and we harvest kind of the core of what it is that you want to work on specifically. Maybe there's challenges that you keep facing, recurring patterns in your relationship or in your work or in finances or whatever the thing is. And maybe it's in all of those categories. 
And then we start to do pattern recognition and look at, okay, where is this showing up in other parts of your life? What's underneath it? Let's not just look at the symptom, but let's look at the root. And then not just think about the root and talk about the root, but actually feel the root, actually go into those places that are uncomfortable and create a safe space for you to be able to process what you need to feel so that you can then ultimately truly evolve beyond it. So that's kind of at the core of what we do. That is super... As you were talking, I was just imagining, I'm like, I need to plug into this. <laughs> I was like, the last you said, well, we've been doing this the last hour. And uh, I have learned a lot. And um, you have you know what it is? It's You've reminded me of a lot of the stuff that I've learned and that I know. And yet maybe for the last six or nine months, I haven't really tapped into. You're reminding me of a lot of the hard lessons I had to learn as I deconstructed my business and I questioned who I am and what I want to do and all the stuff that happened even before COVID, but especially you know when we had this whole shift. And um, I have spent the last six or nine months very much in my head, very much focused on logistics and timing and business and all of this stuff. And you're reminding me of... Um, of a lot of the stuff that maybe I just I've been I've, if if we're gonna hold both right the Buddha and the badass um, the person who who really wants to hustle and make stuff happen but also wants to do it you know in a different way um, you're reminding me of a lot of the stuff that that I knew to be true and kind of got distracted from so I really appreciate that <laughs> beautiful and I would say that's a huge part of my job description is just to remind people of what they already know but don't aren't willing to give true full attention to and we create space where you can actually let that part of you that already knows expand your knowing. And knowing is something we talk a lot about, like how, what are the circumstances? What are the pathways to connect you to your deepest knowing? Because that knowing will inform everything else in your life. You are the common denominator in all other areas of your life. So if you are connected to your knowing and you have that certainty and that trust, ultimately that internal trust with yourself and external trust with life to have your back, then you become unstoppable. Hmm. I have one question for you that's very selfish. You know, I am extremely malleable, um, which is like one of my superpowers. I can connect with almost anyone about almost anything. Um, if I'm watching a certain TV show, I start to talk like I start to talk in the cadence and the rhythm of the TV show I'm watching. Uh, if I'm around a bunch of my, you know, like more conservative entrepreneur friends, I take on more conservative habits. If I'm around um, my much more progressive friends, I'm suddenly over there. So it's like I, I'm like really good at being able to like show up um, and have fun and be the true version of me in all of these. But but I also start to question then, like again early question I asked. Um, I'm not quite sure which one the real version of me is. And um, I'm not sure what advice you'd have for someone like me. The advice I would have is that you're not going to think your way there to the answer. It's not going to come from your cognitive, intellectual, rational mind. It's going to come from something deeper. Mm. And... So what are the circumstances that you could can create that can allow you to create a relationship to that deeper part of yourself? I call it your ancient intelligence. Like, you know, we're in this era of AI and this is like the polarity of that, the ancient intelligence that you are, that we are, if you look at evolution, like we, we are ancient intelligence, our bodies are supercomputers. Our consciousness is profound and we've just never been given the manual for really how to understand how to use this molecular masterpiece that we are and unlock its true potential. So it will require your head, being in your head is safe, right? There's a skeptical part of you, the part of you that questions everything. And that part of you is also your, in some ways, the very thing that makes you brilliant. And also the shadow side of it is it's the very thing that will keep you stuck if you keep letting it be at the forefront of your experience. So to suspend disbelief for a moment and let yourself drop into something deeper. And this is why breathwork might be interesting because it does that pretty reliably. It forces you out of your head. That's why it's a great modality for high achievers. And that's why it's so popular in, in the entrepreneurial biohacking kind of world, because it forces you out of your head. And I'm happy to share a breathwork practice with you that you can experiment with. But start to feel 
start to let yourself feel more and create space for those feelings. So when you go on your morning walk, instead of listening to your book on tape, which is also input, which is also putting you in your head more, what would it look like to listen to really amazing music instead? What would it look like to breathe deeply? What would it look like to just let yourself be instead of always doing something? And it's in those in-between moments that you're going to start to connect to something that has the answers you're looking for. Wow. Ezra, thank you so much. Uh, I have one last question for you. But before I ask it, uh, where is the best place for people to connect with you? You can find us on our website, becomingwithaq.me. And then we are also becoming on social media. Um, yeah. And we're really, we're, I guess the one thing I didn't talk about is we're building a community you know, of change makers, of thought leaders, of people who are committed to transformation from the inside out and for it to not just end with the personal work and be the, you know, the monk on the mountaintop, but actually to let that ripple into really tangible, like large scale businesses and organizations and projects that are purpose driven and that can have a ripple of impact on the planet. So that's what we're building. And we're really excited about all of it. And it's a massive vision and a massive mission. And so if you're feeling called, any of you listening, feel free to check us out and, and dive deep with us. I love your... Um, I love your... I mean, your spirit, and your energy, which you're magnetic. But um, but thank you for sharing. You know, Even earlier when I asked a question, you're like, I'm still kind of working through this and I'm not quite sure. Um, because that's what this is all about, right? You know, we... I struggle with this. I love it and I struggle with it. It worries me that like right now what we're doing, this is life. And this is it. This is all life is unless we choose to make it something else. But every moment that's passing by is like, this is it. Um, and so the fact that you're so open and you're willing to share um, and yet speak with such confidence. <laughs> I need that certainty. So I really do appreciate it. Uh, the final question I have for you is at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Love. I don't know. There's this may sound cliche, but the, at the core, like, why do we do anything? It's all for love. <laughs> and talking about like capital L love, you know, like the kind of boundary shattering love that happens when we look into the eyes of our child or when we watch an incredible sunrise or when we're stripped down to the core and there's nothing left and we just surrender like those moments of love um i think that's really what it's all about 